Good morning, everybody. It is that time. We are ready to get started. Want to welcome all of you to this webinar today. My name is Jennifer Morse, and I'm with Madcap Software. And today we're going to be talking all about the new features in Madcap Flare uh, 2019 and Madcap Central, the April 2019 release. And I'm just so thrilled to have you all with me today. Talking about new features is always so much fun. So thanks for taking the time out of your busy day and your work week to join me today. We have got a lot to cover, so I just want to touch on a few housekeeping items before we begin. So this webinar will be recorded. We, we get that question a lot, and the good news is, uh, yes, not to worry. If you need to leave early for whatever reason, that's okay. We will send everybody who registered for this webinar a link to the recording as soon as it's done. I also want to point out that there is a question panel or a question area in your GoToWebinar um, control panel or console. Use that as a place to ask questions. Um, depending on the timing and, and what we've got to cover today, we're going to do our best to answer as many questions that come in. Um, but, but if we don't get to them all, uh, again, just like the recording, we'll be sending out all of the questions and answers afterward. So if your question doesn't get answered, we didn't ignore you, uh, we, we absolutely will do our best to get back to you as quickly as possible. And, and we'll send out that question and answer um, uh, to everybody. So uh, want to make sure, you know, quick technology check that you can all hear me and that you can all see my screen. Um, you know, I, I gave a little offering to the GoToWebinar gods before this presentation, so we hope that they're smiling upon us today and all of the connections are strong. So if you can't see my screen or hear me for whatever reason, give us a high sign and we'll do our best to help you out behind the scenes. But it sounds like I'm getting some positive thumbs up that you can hear and, and see me, so I'm happy to hear that that part is working. All right, our agenda today. Well, this is what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the new features in Flare, uh, what's new in Central, and then I'm gonna make a quick update to the authoring and management system, or at least talk about uh, one quick slide. And then of course, we'll certainly get to those questions that you have. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Let's, let's get into it. The first thing I wanna talk about is I wanna focus on the features of Flare 2019. And one of the first things I wanna cover is the new updated interface. I also wanna point out, I'm gonna be doing some bouncing around between PowerPoint and Flare today. I'm gonna to try to do it as elegantly as possible. Um, so forgive me if it's a little bit uh, rickety. I'm, I'm trying to go back and forth to these two applications quickly. Uh, so here we go. <laughs> so updated interface, this is the first thing that I wanna talk about today. So one of the first things you're going to notice when you launch Flare is an updated and freshened and modernized UI. So we took the themes that were in Flare previously and we've updated them a bit. Um, we've also updated the start page to Flare. So as you can see, oops, I'm going a little quickly here. The, the start page has been redesigned. So we streamlined it a little bit. We took out some of the stuff that was on there just to make it easier to navigate. Here we've got a list of all of our recent projects that, that we've been working on. We can, of course, pin projects that we access often. Uh, we can filter, we can put a little search in here. So if I need to search on, on a project that's in my list, I can start searching and it will retrieve those results based on those keywords that we're typing in. So a new way to quickly find uh, recent projects that we've got open. Of course, we can open an existing project, we can start the new project wizard, and we give quick access to the help. We've also streamlined this news and update section uh, to make it a little easier on the eyes. So uh, mention some of the themes and the colors. So one thing you'll notice if you go, if you're one of those that likes to play with the themes and the colors, if we go to the file menu and we pop down to the options, just to kind of show you where these things are, in the interface tab, this is where you can change out the themes. So right now I'm on the silver. So we always had the silver classic and black, and these are what have been updated. So right now I'm on the silver. Um, if I were to load, choose the black one there, we'll see it change just a little bit. So that's the new black theme. And then the classic updated slightly with some new colors, and then that silver. That's the one I like, so that's the one I'm gonna stick with today. So that's how we change out the new themes. Also, let me close this out. If I were to start a new project here quickly, 
our built-in project templates have been redesigned updated and freshened up a bit so we still have these new these templates that we've that we've always had we have online templates online and print the print based ones the tutorial project of course you've got just a plain old empty project there but the built-in project templates have been redesigned and freshened up with new skins new styles with CSS variables that we're going to talk about today, which is kind of exciting. Um, so of course, you can start new projects based on these, these templates. And we also give you access here. Um, if, if you haven't uh, gone to our one of our resources pages on our website, we give you quick access right here. It says download additional project templates. This is going to take you out to our website. We've got this living page where we're constantly adding new project templates there. So these are free project templates that you can download and customize further. Um, you know, they're not meant to be the be all end all in terms of look and feel, um, but uh, you, you know, they, they have a lot of the heavy lifting taken care of in terms of some of the styling and the skins and things. So they're meant to just be downloaded and customized to your own branding requirements. But if you haven't popped over there yet, it's a great place to get some ideas and uh, perhaps download a, a fresh new template and, and get started on a new look and feel. So take a look at that, but we wanted to give quick access to those too. Now the CSS editor also got a few new updates. And before I show you the new one in this version, I just want to pop up the style sheet from 2018 real quick, just to give you a quick comparison. Uh, so this is Flare 2018. This is well, a style sheet that I have in the project. And I've actually got quite a few mediums of my style sheet loaded here. So in, in the previous version and in versions, you know, of course, before 2018, when we loaded multiple mediums in the style sheet, things looked a little bit busy with all of these properties in place here. So what we did in this new version is I'll go ahead and pull up Flare 2019. So give yourself a quick visual snapshot of this. So I'm going to put this away. And let's go back to Flare 2019. I'm going to open up my style sheet here. And let me go ahead and select something so we can see some content in there. So I've got multiple mediums selected here. But notice that we've got that ellipsis button. So we've replaced that field with an ellipsis button. So we can see more of what's happening uh, at once. So it's a little cleaner. It's a little bit less cluttered. We can still get in here and, and, and select that little ellipsis button to change the property. Um, but it just looks a little bit more clean. Uh, we don't have all of those, those fields and the clutter there. So we can certainly uh, click in here and type if, if it's available, or we can choose this little ellipsis button to make a different selection. So that's what I wanted to cover on the interface. Now, kind of along the lines of um, the styles and style sheets, since we were just talking about it, um, is I, I want to start on a, on a major new feature that we've just introduced, which is uh, support for CSS variables. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with CSS variables. And of course, I would ask you to raise your hands, but I can't see you. But I'm, I sort of am feeling some virtual yeses and nos on the other end of the line. Uh, but CSS variables, they're not anything that Madcap invented, but more or less curious if you all have heard of it. Well, so let's talk about what they are and why they're cool. So we, we've had text variables, right? We've, those have always been available in Flare, where we can have a little placeholder for a short string of text. They're so useful and handy when it comes to single source publishing. Well, now we can use CSS variables, which we can use with our styles to enhance the single sourcing workflow even more. So I want to go over just a few things about CSS variables and what they are and, and, and why they're cool. And then I want to switch over to Flare and we'll talk about the mechanics and show you how easy it is to create them, to apply them, and edit them. So let's talk about these real quick. So why are these things so cool? Well, a CSS variable lets you place the value of a style in one place and reuse it on as many elements as you want throughout your style sheet. So using CSS variables can save a lot of time when it comes to updating uh, and, and, and changing and editing your style sheet. So much like our text variables, whenever you want to change the value, you only need to do that in one place. And the new value of that style is propagated everywhere that that variable is referenced. OK, so you may be thinking, and, and I actually thought this too, uh, if, if you were one of those who had, you know, when I asked if you've ever heard of CSS variables, if you said no, well, I was in that 
uh, group uh, until very recently. And so I started learning about them. And I thought to myself, well, okay, well, I can change my font color for my H1s and my H2s and my CSS. No problem, okay? But what if we use the same color for H1, H2, maybe the border color around a note, or maybe the bottom border under a drop down? So you go into your style sheet and you set that gray color on all of those individual elements. Great, we're not doing it manually in the topic. That's a big no-no. We obviously wanna use our style sheet for that. But what if your marketing department comes along? I'm not gonna throw marketing under the bus, but let's say they come along and they say, hey team, we're going through a bit of a brand refresh. Yay, aren't you excited? And they want you to change from that dark gray color that you had applied to all of these elements in your style sheet to maybe a slightly different dark gray to support the new corporate branding guidelines. Okay, so we're not gonna go into all the individual places where we set that style, obviously. We go into all of the elements in our CSS where we applied that dark gray, co gray color and change it. Well, if we used a variable, we wouldn't have to do that. We can update that color value in one place and that change is gonna propagate everywhere it's used. Well, you may be thinking, oh, okay, well, I can just use find and replace, right? I know what, I, I, I know how to use find and replace. I'm gonna go in there and, find that hex value in my project and find everything and replace it with the new hex value for that gray color that we need to use. I don't need variables. Well, wh what if you don't like using find and replace? What if it makes you a little bit nervous? What if you didn't type in the right hex value for that gray color? Maybe you just typed, maybe not you, but maybe uh, somebody who didn't mean to typed in a slightly different hex value for that gray that looked kind of like the gray you're supposed to use, but it wasn't exact. Or maybe they didn't use a hex value. What if they just typed in gray for one of those properties? Find and replace could get a little tricky. It could miss some spots. Um, you may not yield perfect results, or you may have to go through that exercise more than once. Well, we don't have to do that. Again, using a CSS variable for that dark gray color can be so helpful. You don't need to worry about inconsistencies in your CSS or all of the individual elements where you set that color. You can define the gray color for that variable and that color will update everywhere it's used. Now I'm using color as an example here because colors can be written in lots of different ways and, and often set in your style sheet on individual elements. So remember you may have font colors, you may have border colors, you may have background colors. So when we say colors here, we're not just talking about font colors. And by the way, you're not limited to just using colors. You can use variables for lots of properties like size or fonts, for example. So you can quickly spot these variables in your style sheet when you start to use them. They're any property that starts with two dashes. And as you can see, you can use whatever name you want for the variable. You're not limited to the CSS property names like color, width, font, dash, family. So as an example, you may have a color, say, a, maybe a brand color that you want to use for many of your headings. You may also want to use that same color for visible borders around certain notes or warnings, for example. You can call it something like brand and maybe leave yourself a little comment in the style sheet and say, hey, brand is for these things. So they're flexible in that way. So when you insert these variables, it's gonna look like this in your style sheet. So here's a very simple H1 example. And so this is how it's gonna look when actually applied. Um, so, so let's kind of talk about the mechanics here. Let's play with these in Flare and I'll show you how easy it is to create them, uh, apply them, and then edit them in the future. So let's go ahead and put PowerPoint away for a moment. I'm gonna bring up Flare and we're gonna dig in and actually do this together. All right, so I've got my Flare project open here. I've got my style sheet. Let me take get rid of some of these mediums. We don't need so many of these. Let me turn off some of these just to create a little extra real estate here. And maybe we'll just keep these two, that's fine. So I've got my style sheet open here. Now you'll wanna be in the advanced view of your style sheet. So right now you can see I'm in the advanced view of my style sheet. One of the things you'll notice is this new selector over here called variables. So I've already got, I've got this uh, root here. Now in my project, 
I already have a handful of variables in here, but I'm going to show you how we can create them and then apply them and then edit them. So we're, we're managing these types of variables in our style sheet and we can call them whatever we want. So I've got a handful here, dark gray, light gray, medium gray, and I've got some properties set to them. When we want to create a new variable, we can come up here. There's a new button in our style sheet editor. Again, you'll want to be in your advanced view to see this. There's a new button here called CSS variable, and we have the option to add new CSS variable. You can also right click on variables. Now I'm, I'm, a, I'm a right click kind of gal, so I love the right click menu. I can often find about 90% of the things I want to do. But I can also add a new style sheet, or I'm sorry, a new CSS variable from here. No matter which way you choose, you come to the same window or the same dialog, which is the add new CSS variable dialog. So a few things, let's talk about this. HTML element, you want to choose an element. Now, most of the time, you're going to want to keep it at the root. That way, the variable is available to you globally in your style sheet. You can create CSS variables at those individual um, selected levels, like a P or an H1, but then it only becomes available in that particular selector. So the the, the it, and this is there's no right or wrong here, but from everybody that I've, I've I've talked to about this and everything I've read, it's a good idea to put them at the root level so that they're available to you globally in your whole style sheet. So I've chosen root. We want to give it a name. So this is one of those things where, again, we're not limited to the CSS property names. We can give this, we can call it whatever we want. Now, I'm going to create one called brand, which is what we were just looking at, because maybe we have a particular brand color that we want to use for different elements that matches some, some product stuff, some product look and feel. So I'm just going to type brand here. Now we want to select a property type. So what we did here is we pre-populated this with probably the four most common property types that people will use these variables for in, in colors, font families, image URLs, and size. I'm going to stick with color because it, I, I really, it makes a lot of sense to me, um, but we want to create this, this additional color variable. So I'm going to choose color, but I do want to point out that you can you can do custom. You can put whatever property type you want in here. So this would be limit. This would be uh, based on the CSS properties. So I'm going to choose color, and now I'm going to choose value. So this is where I can type in the hex value of the color if I know it. Of course, I've got my little drop down here. I can select a color. Um, I can use um, this color picker here if I want to to drop in the color. Or one of my favorites is this little eyedropper icon where I can scroll over elements of the UI and get the actual hex value. So because this is our brand color, I'm going to go ahead and choose this hex value because I want to create a variable that matches um, my product branding color. So I'll go ahead and select it. It automatically drops in that hex value for me. And the other thing I want to point out is the resulting CSS is written for us here. We don't have to know how to code this in our CSS ourselves. I mean, if you know how, awesome go for it. But for those of us who don't, what's nice is this dialog adds the resulting CSS to our style sheet or the actual code into our style sheet for us. So we would see this if we opened up our style sheet, but we don't have to know how to do this. This little dialog is writing it in there for us. So now I'll click OK, and that new brand variable is added to my variables list here. Now what if I want to use it? Well, easy to create, just as easy to apply. So maybe I want to use this as my heading color for maybe heading one, heading two, and heading three, for example. So I'll pop over to my H1. And right now, it's just inheriting something from the body tag there. But now that my variables are created, I can right click on color. And I have the option now to insert a CSS variable. All of the variables that I've created for my project or in my project are available to me now. So I'm going to select brand. That's the what I want. That's the one I want to use. And here it is applied. Notice I get a little preview. So there it is. It's not black anymore. It's taking on the properties of that variable. So same with H2. Let's go ahead and apply it here. I'll insert a CSS variable for brand. And maybe we need to use it on H3 as well. Okay, so we've created our variable, we've applied them. Again, some time goes by and marketing says, hey, Jen and team, we're not using this color anymore. We're using something else. I need you to update all of your style sheet 
and everything so that it matches that proper brand color. Well, we're not going to go into all of the elements on our style sheet where we set that hex value individually. We're just going to update our variable. So back to our variables we go once we get the new values from marketing or we know what we're supposed to use. So maybe we need to update this. Well, again, I'm just going to choose a different color. Now I'm going to choose something that's really going to stand out so that we can see it. So maybe it's going to be this bright red. Okay, so I'll go ahead and change it. I've updated my variable. So let's have a look at the elements where we applied it. So if I go to H1, all of my H1s are red. All of my H2s are red. All of my H3s are red. So again, once it's applied, really easy to update that variable and replace that value everywhere we've used it. And by the way, we can do it here. We can update them there in our style sheet, but we can also use the um, uh, the formatting window to apply it too. So I'll go ahead and open up another topic here just for fun. So here's my, notice here that it's red. Well, if I had my formatting window open and it's red because that's the value that we set on the variable and H1 is using that variable for the color. So I invoked the formatting window here right from the home screen, which opens up. So no matter what I click on here in my topic, we can see what's making up the property of that selection. So I've got H1 selected now. So these are all of the CSS properties that are making it look like that. And it even shows us the variables here. So if we need to update that brand variable, we can even do it here within our topic. Okay, so maybe we wanna set it back. We'll go ahead and set it back to that blue color, let's say. Okay, so I'll click okay. And it actually will write that change into our style sheet. So we can update it in our CSS directly, or if you're a fan of that formatting window, you can update it there as well. So I think these are really cool. I hope you all have some fun with these, but I think this is gonna save a lot of time and really ensure consistency in your style sheets and, and make things easier to update and manage going forward. All right, so a couple considerations, again, back to PowerPoint real quick with CSS variables. Normal rules of inherit inheritance and cascading apply to CSS variables. Um, they are case sensitive, so make sure you're consistent when creating and using them. So capital B brand is different than lowercase b brand. So they are case sensitive, so be mindful of that. Um, one thing you can point out, if you, if you remember, uh, I'll pull Flare back up here in just a second, but I had two um, mediums in my style sheet selected. I had the default or the sort of the web medium, and I also had the print medium loaded. Well, you can change the value of those variables and under that at media section in order to override the value of the default medium. So if we want a different value for the variable when we go to print or a smaller screen size is detected, we can override what's set on the default medium to whatever we want in another medium. Again, we only have to manage that value in one place. And everywhere we make that change, it will be um, applied. What about our old friend, Internet Explorer? Well, unfortunately, CSS variables are not supported in IE. But not to worry, we have a checkmark box for that. So to account for those that need to support viewers on IE, pulled up a little screenshot of our target file in our uh, in the little tab advance there, our friend the advanced tab, there is a checkmark box. And so when we enable this checkmark box, the CSS variable will be replaced with the actual value in the output so that the reader sees what you want them to see if you have viewership on uh, Internet Explorer. So I just wanna make sure that was that I point that out because I, I heard that a lot in chatter, but wait, what about IE? I don't wanna run into any issues. Don't worry, we got a check mark box for that. All right, so let's move on. Let's talk about micro content. Guys, this is really cool. What is micro content? Maybe you've been following some of our chatter on the LinkedIn groups and some of the blogs that we've been coming out with. So maybe you've heard of this term, maybe you haven't. But what this micro content is all about is, is pretty neat. And, and micro content can be text, it can be images, it can be video, it can be anything consumed by a reader in about 10 to 20 seconds. 
this content is becoming increasingly important for technical communicators and content developers, as so many consumers of content today expect short, concise, relevant answers to questions that they may have about a product or, ser or service. So micro content can be, sort of be thought of that, maybe that appetizer or that teaser to other content. It captures the reader's attention and answers a question or a need quickly, often providing links to additional information, maybe a list of search results or links to other sites. So micro content needs to be precise. And we, but on the flare side of things, what does it mean for content developers? Well, we wanna be able to stick to the reuse concepts that we all know and love. So I'm gonna ask a silly question here. How many of you have used Google? Okay, everybody's raising their hands because we all look at our phones. You know, I, I could say Google, but generally any search engine. Um, so I can't see you raising your hands, but I'm, I'm assuming you are. But we see micro content all the time when we use Google. Think about when you do a search, you see these directed short bits of content that can answer your query, in addition to the billions of pages of results that you're used to seeing. So here's an example where I search for Italian restaurants near me. I get these quick directed results. I mean, yeah, you can see there's almost 3 million results if, if I wanna sort through them, but this is this is what I need. You know, I, I'm, I'm sitting like, you know, right, here, so I have some really quick choices that I can go to around me. Um, here's another example. Uh, I just got addicted to this show called The Wire. I don't know, again, I don't know if any of you have heard of this show, The Wire. It's, it's not new, it's been on HBO for some time, but I just discovered it, so I just got hooked. Uh, and I, I am obsessed with this show, and as I'm sitting there binge watching this show, you know, I'm like, who is this actor, who is this, I mean, Idris Elba plays this, this pretty bad guy in the show, but he's so good. And I didn't know anything about him. So as I'm sitting there completely entrenched, I did a quick Google search on my couch. And in two seconds, I get this nice little snapshot of my favorite new actor. So all of these are micro content examples. They're these little, it's that little teaser of restaurants or that side panel in Google that shows up when you do a search for somebody famous. I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up for The Wire. Don't tell me, don't spoil anything. I'm just I'm just starting, so I can't wait to keep going with it. But if you guys haven't watched this show, I encourage you to try to get it. It's, it's amazing. Okay, so another bit here. So I'm, use, I'm using Google in, as an example. So many of us are used to using it, but there are these things called search engine results page features. That is a mouthful of marble. So we're going to shorten it to SERP, S-E-R-P for short. And they display on the page with regular search results. So one SERP feature that I see and use all the time are these featured snippet results, which will often answer a specific question. So here's one I typed in recently. How do I blanch green beans? So quick side note, don't tell anyone, but at the ripe old age of 46, I hadn't ever blanched anything. So I consulted Google. And as I'm fumbling around, my 13-year-old daughter in the kitchen said, duh, mom, just ask Google. So I typed in my query. And yeah, there are about a million results to sift through. But this featured snippet result tells me in seconds what I need to do and I get this quick little visual. So if I want more information, of course I can click that link or I can sift through the millions of hits beneath it. So if you've never blanched anything, you're welcome. There's a quick 30 second set of instructions. Another area where we're seeing the need for micro content, chatbots or voice-based virtual assistants providing directed answers to questions, so more of this conversational experience. So chatbots are only effective as the information that's fed and consumed by the chatbot. So the content that we give it or the answer needs to be concise and to the point. We see micro content in the form of embedded help or these little micro learning moments that are highly contextual to what a user may be doing. This popped up when I launched GoToMeeting the other day. So this little tidbit of the new app. So it's it's not the whole kit and caboodle user guide or help file, but it's this, these little bits of learning objects that are fed to me. We don't have to leave the app like traditional context sensitive help that opens in another window. These are quick, directed nuggets of information embedded as the embedded as the UI. So that's another example we see. 
We see micro content connected to the world of augmented reality, where you've got this virtual content blended with real world scenarios, which is a really big trend in training and development. So rather than look through the massive book describing engine parts, imagine this augmented reality where we can use our phone to hover over the engine elements and get information quickly on the instrument cluster. So in this example, you know, we've got this image, this radiator cap, pointing to a snippet of content or maybe a movie or a simulation that's gonna show us how to remove it. Uh, so in this example, some sort of ID is paired with a response or some set of instructions or a simulation. So I wanna show this image just to kind of summarize because it does a really good job of wrapping some of these things together. Um, micro content is really the backbone for so many things that we see now and that we will continue to see as this technology continues to evolve. So just as the industry shifted from linear book-based authoring years ago to topic-based authoring, which is sort of that world we're in now, so will a content author's ability to create micro content become even more prevalent and important. So content creators need an easy way to create micro content not only from scratch, but you should be able to leverage and repurpose existing content. I mean, content reuse is, that's what we do, right? That's our wheelhouse with, with Flare. So in this new release, we wanted to make it easy for authors to not only create new micro content in the form of phrase and response pairing for a reader's consumption, but also leverage what you've got already created and, and tag it easily as micro content. So as we see in this image, micro content that's created in Flare, which is this, this we're going we're gonna to look at this together. These are phrases paired with responses. These can become featured snippets in your search results. So that's what we're doing here. That's what this box is. That's what we can make out of Flare right out of the box. This is the easiest, most immediate way to use micro content from Flare and how we're implementing it out of the box today. But as you can see from this diagram, with just a little bit of elbow grease, you can use this content for other things that I've mentioned too. So, you know, chatbots, machine learning applications, virtual augmented reality, field level help, all these things. So um, as this all evolves, I suspect that this diagram is gonna change in terms of what Flare will make out of the box. And so we're watching this very closely and we're listening to what the community is doing and what they want, particularly as standards start to develop for these things. You know, there's not a lot of standards for some of this stuff. You know, I, I kind of equate it to, you know, translation, right? So, you know, in the world of translation, we've got this standard called XLIF, which is this nice interchange format that so many tools can use. Well, we don't really have you know, solid standards in place for some of these things and what these things can talk to. The good news is our micro content file is translatable to these things. It's not out of the box right away. But again, if you knew what you were doing with a little elbow grease, you can transform it into these other things. But what we're doing out of the box is this featured snippet results. So again, we're listening, we're watching, we're, we're excited to see how this is going to evolve because I suspect some exciting things to come uh, in, in this field. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into Flare. I wanna show you how we can create micro content and then how we can use micro content in search. But I wanna start with the end in mind for a moment. What does this look and feel like if we were to use featured snippets and search results? Since this is how we're implementing it out of the box initially. So I'm gonna switch just a moment. I'm gonna come out of PowerPoint here and see if I can um, bring up my Okay, so I'm, again, I'm starting with the end in mind. What we're looking at here, I brought up a browser window. I did a search. Now, by the way, this is the help for Flare 2018. Um, now, as I mentioned, this is how we're, we're using these things out of the box. I used to say we eat our own dog food around here, but somebody corrected me and said, Jen, you should say we drink our own champagne because that sounds a little bit more elegant. So I'm switching my tone. I'm going to say we're drinking our own champagne around here and we're using these things now. So this is the help file from Flare 2018. I did a search for snippets. I got 473 great results that I can run through. 
maybe I'm really new to Flare and I don't know what they are. And boy, that's a lot of stuff to sift through. Well, let me pull up the help for Flare 2019. Oops, I think it's this guy here. I shrunk them down so I could see them side by side. Here we go. Let me make this a little bit smaller. Now, this is the help for Flare 2019. Same search query, but look at the different experience. Yeah, I got a lot of results, but what we did is we're using these featured snippets and search results. This is a bit of micro content, and it's the first thing that displays. Really quick answer. You know, we've got some additional content here we can click through if we want, and we've got this little video to show us what it looks like to drag a snippet into multiple topics. So again, it's a slightly different experience and we have this directed answer to our query. Um, and again, you know, we, it can be text, it can be video, it's quite flexible. So how do we tag this stuff and how do we make it? Okay, so let's put this away. Let's open up Flare and, and we'll take a look at, at creating this stuff. But I wanted to show this as a quick visual because you can see the difference. Because again, when I first was presented with this, I'm like, huh? I kind of was scratching my head until I actually saw it. Um, you know, it's a little bit different even than, a you know, think of about a, you know, some of you may be thinking, well, I got my glossary. It shows up first. Well, glossary is just text. Here we can structure this micro content in lots of ways. We can put these, you know, um, these little drop downs in here. We can insert a movie. We can't do that in a glossary file. So I'm using the term featured snippets here. It's kind of a, it's kind of confusing. Um, the, this micro content doesn't necessarily have to be a snippet. It can be a topic. It can be a snippet. It can be content that you write natively in the editor, which I'll show you. So I just wanted to clarify that. I started, you know, playing this back in my head. I'm like, I hope people aren't confused. We're not limited just using snippets. This is sort of a general term we're using to describe this feature. So let's pop over to Flare and let's take a look at what this feels like. Okay, so here we are in Flare. One of the first things you're going to want to do is have a micro content file. Now, those of you that have been using Flare for some time, you'll you know that there's always a resources folder in every project. But for those of you that are newer to Flare, one thing to point out is that every project you create always has a resources folder, and it turns out some pretty cool things hang out in this resources folder. So things that support our topics, style sheets, for example, the, the you know what we've been talking about it that controls the look and feel of our topics, snippets, which are those reusable chunks of content which we insert into our topics by reference, master pages, images, etc. The other thing that likes to hang out in our resources folder by default is a micro content file. So if you've got Flare 2019 and you're open up, opening up your resources folder and you don't have one there, it's really easy. You can just right click, go down to new and add new micro content file. So that's gonna drop it in this resources folder for you. Or you could create a new folder if you really wanted to stay tidy, create a new folder, call it micro content and drop the file in there. I mean, honestly, this, this file can live anywhere. It doesn't matter, but just trying to keep it tidy and we recommend keeping it in the resources folder. So the first thing is to drop that con uh, micro content file in there. Once you've added the file, I'll go ahead and double click it here. That micro content file loads our micro content editor. And it's sort of this split pane where on the left-hand side, we've got the area where we can create our phrases. And then we've got this area here on the right where we can have our responses, our responses. We can create these phrases a few different ways. And I wanna to touch on those. So in my micro content file, I've already got a phrase called elves. Now I'm a bit of a Lord of the Rings nerd if you haven't noticed. So I based my project on that. And I will say I had all these super fun images that I was using, but I removed them for fear of copyright infringement. So imagine these really fun images that used to be here. I had to genericize it a little bit. So I've got this phrase here called elves and I'm actually linking it to this entire topic. So this entire topic called elves, I'll open it up here so that you can see, all of the content is coming from this topic here. So, well, why is that cool? Well, it's content that I've already leveraged. So it's, you know, it, it, I don't have to rewrite it. I've just linked to it. Um, we can create new phrases right here. So this is linking to an entire topic. If I wanna create a new phrase, I can click this button. Maybe I'll create a phrase called Gondor, okay? Now I can come in here and I can type information. However, I can link to content that I may already have. I can link to a topic. 
I can link to a bookmark section in a topic. I can link to a snippet that I've created. So this time, so in this example, Elves, I linked to a topic. This time, I'm going to go ahead and link to a snippet that I've created. OK, so there's my snippet content. In both of these examples, we have this little warning here. It can't be edited because the whole bit here is connected via a link. If we wanted to, we could break the link and you know, uh, remove the connection from that actual file and edit it. That's a choice. It's kind of like when you drop a snippet into a topic and then you desnippetize it, right? You convert that snippet to text. You 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 break that link between that snippet block and and the file from where it's coming from. Same thing. You can do that, but then you're kind of losing that that content reuse aspect. We can also create content fresh, as I mentioned. We don't necessarily have to link to existing content. So if I want to create another phrase, I'll go ahead and type it in. Maybe this time I'm going to type in Mordor. OK, so I can come in here in my editor. I can just start typing. I can say, you know, whatever I want. Mordor is yucky, right? If I can't type with so many people watching. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Don't go there. All right, so we can type our content in there. But what if we're typing a topic or we're looking at a topic and we find some content that we think would be a good um, bit of micro content that we want to use? Well, we can do that too. So I'm going to pop over to my topic real quick. So I'm going to, I have this topic here called Mordor. What if I'm typing away and I'm looking and I, I notice, hey, this looks like a nice bit of micro content right here. Well, I can select my element while I'm typing or whenever. And kind of like when we create new snippets, we've got this new button up here in the home ribbon called Create Micro Content. So with my element selected or my content selected, I can create micro content and I can type in a phrase. So I'm going to type in Mordor and I'll click OK. And it actually replaced, it, it created that phrase, it replaced it with that element that I've already got typed. So we can we can again natively edit edit it here in the um, in the response editor. We can link a phrase to an existing topic or a bookmark within a topic or a snippet that we've written, or we can go into an existing topic and create micro content from that content. And again, we're creating that link. If we go into any of these topics or snippets or this element here in our topic and we update it because it's got that connection all of that content will be updated. We're only changing it and updating it in one place. So if I change the text here and I save my changes, well, that's going to show up here in my micro content file because I've, I've got that, that link established. The other thing you can do is you can create alternate phrases that point to the same response, right? Because you may, you may decide that, you know, we want people to search on different phrases, but we want it to point to the same thing. So in my example for snippets, I could type in, you know, maybe there's an alternate phrase in the micro content editor. So it's not just snippets that points to this, this nice answer, this micro content answer, but maybe what are snippets points to the same thing. So we can create these alternate phrases. So maybe here in Gondor, I decide, well, here's a little button here, add an alternate phrase. And I can say, where is Gondor? OK, so no matter, gosh, I cannot spell. So no matter what I type on, either Gondor or where is Gondor, it's going to point to the same answer. So it's a way to create these directed, um, concise answers to these queries. Now, there's a case, you know, sometimes when I first thought about this, I'm like, well, gosh, that's nice. You can have all these alternate phrases. They point to the same answer. Where does one begin? Um, one thing that you may want to be thinking about, and if, if you're not doing it already, the case for data is really important when it comes to micro content. Um, I, I, and so if you're not looking at what people are searching on and the search queries that people are using, if you want to utilize this, I think that's a wonderful place to begin. There's that great phrase out there, and I, and I'm, I feel silly that I, I don't know who coined it, but it's that phrase, in God we trust, all else all else must provide data or everyone else must provide data. Data is so important with stuff like this and it can really help you. Now you don't need it, but it's wonderful to kind of understand, well, what are my customers searching on? How can we make the search better based on how they use it every day? And that's actually what we did. There's a great topic in our documentation. I'm going to pull up 
um, my what's new topic here. So I'm in the what's new topic for, for Flare. You all have this, if it's on their website. But under this major new features in the micro content section, there's a ton of stuff about using it, creating it, editing it, and all that fun stuff. But this is really helpful. What does Madcap do? And we talk about the power of analytics, understanding what people are searching on as a basis to create these queries or these, these phrases that we're gonna start with. So yeah, you can start from scratch, but think about analytics. Think about using Pulse or Google Analytics. Understand what your customers are searching on with your published content as a way to, as a basis really um, to, to start with these, these phrases. And then think about what can you leverage in your existing uh, content. So again, topics can be leveraged, snippets can be leveraged, new content can be authored right in the editor here. If we happen to be in a topic, we can select content and just make it micro content. So lots of different ways to build out these phrases that point to these directed answers. I think a big benefit of using a topic or a snippet as your response, rather than just typing it in the editor here um, uh, on its own, is that if you have to be mindful of responsiveness, if your viewers are looking at content on a smaller screen, creating these, and we actually call them little mini landing pages. If you'll, you'll read in that help topic, what, what our doc team did is they created snippets as little mini landing pages and used that as the basis for responses so that we could use the responsive layout editor because when we create snippets and topics, we have access to the responsive layout editor in Flare where we can, we can structure content on the page so that you know, as our screen size gets smaller, everything stacks appropriately the way we want. So that's a big benefit to using a topic or a snippet. This micro content editor yet doesn't yet have any kind of responsive layout capabilities. So if you need to be mindful of that, I would encourage you to use topics or snippets as your responses for micro content because you have a lot more flexibility. And you'll see here, if we come up over here, let me make this bigger now that I don't have to shrink it down. Let me refresh the page. Um, so, oh, here it is. It's this guy here. So this is what it looks like in our big screen. But again, if we shrink this down to a much smaller screen size, so that's kind of tablet, but watch what happens when we get even narrower. If we were looking at this you know, on a phone, see how everything's stacked appropriately? So we're not using our thumb and our index finger to look at everything. By using a snippet here in Flare, we were able to design this using a responsive layout so that if we were consuming this on a smaller screen size, it looks the way we want it to look. Okay, so lots going on. I know I've just scratched the surface there. There's, we could go on and on about micro content, but I'm looking at the time and we've got some more things to cover. Um, all right, so let's talk about the next thing. And let's talk about Madcap Connect for Zendesk. So there's a new plugin in Flare 2019 that makes it easy to publish output to your Zendesk Help Center dashboard. So um, if you have some or all of your topics that need to be accessed in your Zendesk guide, because that's gonna be the presentation layer for some or all of your content, by using this new plugin, you don't need to copy and paste into Zendesk, restyle it in Zendesk, and then rinse and repeat that manual process every time there's an update to that content. You can update it in Flare and publish. All the places where that topic's gonna go, well, all of those changes are going to, to cascade and go there, okay? So I wanna review some of the mechanics in Flare and show how it all looks published in Zendesk, but first, I just, real quick public service announcement on how to get this plugin installed if you wanna test and tinker with it. Because you're gonna need that in addition to your Zendesk account. So when you install Flare 2019, now I was guilty of this when I just installed it. We, you know, we go fast and we just choose default and we just breeze through it to get it installed. Well, that was wrong. <laughs> so when you install 2019, um, slow down a little bit, choose that custom button. When you choose that custom button and then choose next, you're gonna have the option to install Madcap Connect for Zendesk. So I was guilty of breezing through this, but again, just letting you know, that you want to choose that custom button. Now, what if you did breeze through it, okay, and you want to test it? Well, all you need to do is go into your Windows programs, you know, the, the uh, programs and files list in Windows, navigate down to Flare 2019 in that list, and click uninstall. But don't worry, you're not actually uninstalling it. You're going to get a screen when you click uninstall that looks like this. All you need to do is click modify, and that's going to take you to that first installation screen 
where you can choose custom and then select the plugin to install. Okay, so the, uh, that's how we get it installed. So we'll need that and we're gonna need obviously a Zendesk guide account. So let's take a look at Flare again and take a look at some of the gearing to make all of this work. So let me pull, put PowerPoint away. I'm gonna bring up Flare. All right, so there's a few things that we wanna be mindful of. Let me close some of these files so that we can focus here on just the things I wanna talk about. Okay. All right, so let's talk about some of these Zendesk mechanics. So much of this stuff is gonna come from your project organizer, which controls a lot of the gearing of our project anyway. I first wanna talk about a table of contents. I recommend that if you're publishing to Zendesk, create a different table of contents that you're going to use and maintain for publishing. Why? Well, Flare tables of contents are extremely flexible. Um, and you can have you know, many levels of nested books. You can have top level books pointing to topics. So we can, we can be pretty flexible with Flare TOCs. Zendesk TOCs, or they're what they call a TOC, not as flexible. They have a slightly different, well, I shouldn't say not as flexible. Maybe I should say a slightly different paradigm to how they structure and organize content, and that's okay. Um, they've got this, this notion of categories, sections, and then articles. Articles meaning, you know, the, the real meat of everything. Those would sort of be like our topics. So in Flare, in the Flare world, what I did is I created a special table of contents for Zendesk Publishing. And the top level book in my Zendesk table of contents, and I, and I'm, by the way, again, TOCs are stored here in the TOCs folder. Not uncommon to have more than one TOC in a project. Um, but my top level book in my table of contents, this is going to map to a category in Zendesk. My second level book, that's going to map to a section in Zendesk. And then these topics themselves are going to map to actual articles in Zendesk, okay? So category, section, article. So that's how I structured my TOC. That's the first big thing you wanna be mindful of. The next thing is you wanna create a publishing destination in Flare. So a publishing destination in Flare is just a set of rules that says, when we build, automatically take my, my built files and put them somewhere. It can be uh, a web server, it can be a file system, you can publish to source control. And in this case, we wanna publish everything that we want from our table of contents to Zendesk. So we'll create a new destination file in Flare. Destinations live in our project organizer in their own little folder. So you'll wanna right click, you're gonna add a destination. You'll give it a name, which is what I did. I just called mine Zendesk so I knew. And once we do that and we've got the plugin installed, we can select a type. So if you've got the plugin installed, you'll be able to select Madcap Connect for Zendesk. Then you're going to want to activate it. When you click that activate button, that's when the trial, because I can see some of these questions coming in, that's when the trial of Zendesk, this little connector starts. It doesn't start when you install it with Flare, whether you have a licensed version or not. The trial of the plugin starts when you actually activate it. So if you install 2019 now and you're interested in this and you don't have time, no worries. You can try it when you're ready. So you'll activate the plugin and then you're going to log into Zendesk. So you're going to log into your Zendesk subdomain, wherever your guide is. You'll click next. You're going to put your username and password and then you'll be logged in. So uh, I'm looking at the time. I'm, I'm running late. So I hope you all can stay on with me a little bit. Um, but I, I want to just run quickly through some of these options. You're going to have some things to choose from. I'm rolling with most of the defaults here. I'm not going to, that's kind of how I like to do it. I just, I just kind of use many of the defaults. But we have to, Zendesk wants us to choose a default category and a default section. This is kind of like a catch-all in the Zendesk world. So I chose this category called FAQ and general to be my, um, my default category. I just kind of rolled with the rest of the defaults here. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. I've got my table of contents. I've got my destination. The very last thing I want to mention is the target file. So I'm not going to go through everything here because I'll bore you to death. But the most important thing is in order to publish to Zendesk, we need to create either an HTML5 or a Kleenex HTML target type. I'm a big fan of the HTML5 target for this because then we can preserve so many of the fun things that we do in Flare, like image thumbnail, behavior, right? You got a big image. Well, it looks small when we first load the page, but when we click it, it gets bigger. Maybe you're using drop downs or text pop-ups. All of that can be preserved in our HTML5 targets when we go to Zendesk. So I recommend HTML5. There's no right or wrong. Um, 
but if you can utilize HTML5 to go to Zendesk, I think that's pretty cool. So we'll choose HTML5. We're going to tell it, of course, what table of contents we want to use, because that's how targets work. Whatever, tar whatever topics we have in our TOC, that's going to go over to Zendesk, or our publishing destination, or our output file, I should say. Now, skin. I want to mention, Zendesk is going to be the presentation layer for all of this content. So we don't need to create a skin in Flare, because we're going to create that, that skin's coming from Zendesk. We don't need to worry about our Flare skin. So I set mine to none. Any conditional text that we want to include or exclude, we can manage here. All of the publishing to Zendesk, our conditions are all respected when we go there. Variables, if we've got any text or our target specific variables that we want to put in here, we can override them when we publish. If we want to, that's fine. Those are all supported and respected when we go to Zendesk. The last thing I want to mention is this publishing tab. Remember, we configured this Zendesk target here. Well, I want to tell my target file what publishing destination I want to use. I only happen to have one in this project, but I chose Zendesk as my, um, uh, as my destination here. So those are, that's it. Those are the three big gears that we need to be mindful of. A table of contents, a publishing destination, and a target to tell Flare, okay, what do we do with all this stuff? How are we going to transform it and, and get it to where we want it to go? Once we have all that in place, all we have to do is click publish. Now, I did the cooking show trick just to save a minute because I knew I was going to be short on time. I went ahead and before the webinar, I took my table of contents uh, and my destination and my target, and I went ahead and clicked publish before the webinar just to save a minute or so. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my web browser, and I'm going to show you what I ended up with. Now, again, I had all these fun uh, pictures here that I had to replace. So just imagine really cool Lord of the Rings images here. But notice that my, my table of contents has become categories and sections, which we'll see in just a moment. So I'll go ahead and select Peoples of Middle Earth. That was that top level book in my Flare TOC. So we'll select that category. So here are the, th the, the sections that I had in my TOC. And these, so Elves was one of that, was that second level, one of the second level books in my table of contents. That became a section. And then the topics that I had in that second level book became the articles. So here's that Elves topic we were just looking at in Flare. There's that image thumbnail that I had in my Flare topic. All of that's supported and preserved when we publish. I have some multimedia here, which was supported. And again, if we're using those fun dynamic effects like drop downs and text pop-ups, this is all coming from my Flare topic. So this little stylistic button, this green, um, you know, when we click it, it's open, it's green. All of that's coming from my Flare style sheet. I even have master page content from my Flare project coming over. So master pages are supported too. Now there are some master page elements in Flare that don't make a lot of sense in Zendesk, like breadcrumb trails, for example. Zendesk already gives you a breadcrumb trail. So if you've got a breadcrumb proxy in your master page that you're publishing for you know, a Flare HTML site, HTML5 site, maybe apply a condition tag to it and exclude it when we go to Zendesk. So you don't need some of those things. You don't need a search bar proxy because Zendesk is giving us the search. Again, Zendesk is wrapping around everything. So some of those things we don't need to worry about. We can take care of all of that when we go to Zendesk. Now, another thing we can do is we can preserve, you know, if we've got custom Flare styling, we can use those themes in our Zendesk guide too. So again, I'm looking at the time. I want to. I don't want to go too quickly here. And I'm not a Zendesk expert. So if you're using Zendesk now, this this probably looks familiar to you. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about how to customize Zendesk themes. But when we build our help file, I'm going to go ahead and open up um, Windows Explorer here. When I, I again, I built this right before the webinar. So I opened up my output file. And when you build you for, for Zendesk, you get this zip file here. So this has all of the bits that Zendesk needs in order to respect the styling when it's displayed on the Zendesk side. So all you need to do is take the zip file. And in, in Zendesk here, I'm in this little thing that looks like an eyeball. This is where you customize your Zendesk themes. All you need to do is click and drag it over. That's it. And when you do that, you can, you'll have a new box here. And you'll be able to set that theme to live. And that's going to respect all that styling that you did. So that's how easy it, it is to get our, if, if we care about using the same look and feel in our Flare outputs that we do in Zendesk, well, then we can just drag the zip file over. If you don't care and you just want Zendesk to take over in terms of the styling, then you don't need to do that step. Zendesk will, will go ahead and, and help you out there. So that's what I wanted to cover there. I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. 
Um, oh, and I just realized I didn't actually build my 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 project. I, I want to do a quick build right now. This should take 10 seconds. I was talking about micro content and we, we built out some of those things, but I didn't actually build it and show you what it looked like in our sample here. So I'm just going to do that quickly. Should take about 10 seconds. And then I want to transition quickly and talk a little bit about Central. So if you can stay on with me for another couple minutes, I'd, I'd, I'd love it. I understand if you have to go, but we will be recording this and sending it to everybody. So let me go ahead and open up. Okay, so I didn't change my, my H1 back, so it's still red. Um, but let's go ahead and search for Gondor. So there's that micro content result. So, okay, well, I've only got eight results here, small project. In the real world, you probably have a lot more topics that that search is handling. But this is a really directed answer to my question. I don't have to look through all the search results. I get a real quick answer what it is. I get this handy little map that I can click on. And I used that snippet. So if we were looking at this on a smaller screen size, all of my content's going to respond appropriately. So I'm not using my thumb and my index finger. I was able to leverage that responsive layout editor to design it. So that's what I wanted to show. I forgot to build and, and, and show that. Same thing with elves. So we'll do a search on elves here. So again, I also want to point out quickly, this search results um, window here, this micro content search result, this is all controlled in our skin. So if you pop into the skin editor in Flare, you'll see a whole new set of, uh, of elements to style with respect to micro content. And so you can tell Flare how much, you know, how tall do you want this to be? Um, you know, how do you want it to look? So there's some elements of styling here. Again, I'm just rolling with the default out of the box one but you can turn the dials in your skin editor and make this search result skin box look how you want. So I wanted to point that out as well. We won't have time to talk about it today, but if you're curious, go into your skin file and your, your top nav or your uh, side nav skin, and you'll see a whole set of elements there to, to customize when it, with respect to micro content. Okay, so let's turn our attention a little bit to Central before we wrap. And I've got it open here. And kind of like Flare, the first thing you're gonna notice when you log into Central is a brand new look and feel. And so I wanna touch quickly on some things here that we've improved in terms of usability. What you're also going to notice if you're using Central or if you're tri trialing this, with this new release, you're gonna find it much I like to, here's a very technical term. I call it snappier. It's faster, it's way more responsive, um, and it, it just feels way more slick. So that's one of the first, thing you're, your, first things you're gonna notice. But you'll also see some elements, and, and I'm gonna kind of start high level and, and drill down a little bit, some global enhancements. There are a lot of multi-select options now on things that didn't have multi-select. So for things like users and projects and teams and all of your target builds. So if you wanna multi-select things and perform the same action on those items, like perhaps change a status, like I'm gonna multi-select these guys here, and maybe I want to reactivate them in one fell swoop. Well, before we'd have to do it one by one. Well, now with them selected, I can just change the status, and I'm going to change them to activate here, and I'll click save. Users have been activated. I'm a big time saver. I love saving clicks when I'm working. So that saved me a bunch of clicks right there. Multi-select, do the same thing to that item. And you'll see that multi-select in lots of areas too. Like for projects, exam for example, if I go into a project and I've um, got multiple builds going on, let me select it here, I'm jumping ahead. I can select more than one of these things and do the same action. Maybe I've got a lot of builds that I need to clean up. Well, I can just multi-select and click delete, for example, or multi-select and keep them. So big time saver there. Page view options. You notice this here. So before in certain things like tasks and projects, there was this pod over here on the right-hand side. Well, we took some of those elements and we moved them across the top a little bit easy to access. So here, notice that in my projects page, I've got my dashboards, builds, checklist files. All of that used to be in this pod over here on the right-hand side. Same thing with tasks. When we load the task board, there used to be this pod over here. Well, we moved these elements across the top. So we can also collapse task cards. This was a, a feature that many of you requested. So if we've got a lot going on here, we can collapse these if we want. It's just a little easier to digest and view at a real high level what the card task card is. We can always select it and get more information if we want to or we can uh, you know, do it one by one if we want. We can still toggle between all of the tasks that people are creating for themselves and creating for others, and we can still toggle between everything on the active board 
and your own individual tasks. We also split out the grid and the calendar view before this was all together and it was a little, in my opinion, a little bit busy. So we broke out the grid, which is sort of this linear list of tasks coming up and the calendar. So these are different now. So here we've got this running list of tasks. We can, of course, collapse them here. We've separated out tasks that have no dates with those that have actual due dates. So again, reordering things to make it a bit easier to use. Um, and we can, of course, get the details of a task if we select it from the calendar. Um, and then the other thing too, if I go back to the active grid, uh, let's say, I'm sorry, the active board, let me show everything, which has got a little bit more stuff. Notice that I, th I just think it's much snappier as we move things around. We can organize these tiles in any order we want. I think before we were limited to like due date or name, uh, but now we can put these in whatever order we want in any of these columns. So we can drag and drop these things. We can still drag them and drop them into different um, status as they, as you know, they progress through their own little life cycle, but we can move them up and down as well. So those are some of the task uh, enhancements. Uh, project enhancements, uh, I, I love this. Let me go back to um, the projects here. If I happen to be in a project, we've actually given you quick access to other projects in your, in the, uh, that have been uploaded. So before, if here I am in this project called Balboa, if I needed to navigate to some other project in Central, I actually had to click on projects and then select it from the list. Well, now I've got quick access to all of the projects right here that I've copied or cloned up in Central. So if I'm in one, I can easily navigate to another. So here it is, and I can go in here and I can do builds and I can get everything. So again, it's a little bit of a click saver, but I love it, it saves time. Um, some of the build enhancements, let me go back to Balboa since I've got some things happening there. If I go back to my Balboa project, we've also restructured this builds area here. Uh, so when we do a build, there used to be this section down here with all of this content. Well, we moved it up into, the e into each individual build. So if I select this guy, notice that I've got my live URL, it's live because I've got a little globe here. I've also got the private URL. So this is the one available to all of my authors in Central, but this is the one that's set to live. I get a little bit of information here, but instead of having it down here at the bottom, it's, um, it's connected to the actual build itself. So we've made some improvements on the way that looks. Um, again, multi-select, as I mentioned, if we need to multi-select and set something to keep or you know, delete a bunch of builds that we're not using, we can quickly multi-select and use the toolbar to do it. Uh, quick enhancement to the build schedule too. So the build schedule means if we've got projects cloned on Central, we can tell Central, hey, build this thing at 1 a.m. every night. So when I come in in the morning, I've got a fresh build to review. So it's this programmatic build process that we can set up in Central ourselves. And I've got one here on this particular target. I got a little clock, but if I right click and I bring up, oops, that's not what I wanted. Bring up the schedule build dialog. I'm telling it here to build at 1 a.m. But we've got, we just added this new clock here and it makes it a little bit easier to quickly select a time, whether a.m., p.m., uh, when we want it to build. We can select our time zone, of course, and what days we want it to build. So slight improvement there on the build schedule. I think it's a little bit easier to use. Uh, a couple of widget enhancements that I want to cover real quick if I pop back over to the home page. Um, obviously, all redesigned. We've increased the number of widgets that we can see here. We, I, I won't get into too many of the details, but when we start dropping these widgets in here and moving them around, we were a little bit limited in terms of our space and how we can design our dashboard. We've made it a little bit more flexible um, in this release, and we can resize and place these things uh, a little bit easier, I think, uh, this go around. Um, the live build widgets also got a little bit of a, let me make this a little smaller so we can see more here. There we go. So this live build widgets, we've always had it, um, but now we've actually uh, put some of the information of the live build, we've sort of collapsed it under here. So we've got the vanity information and I can see the live URL of that particular build. So slight redesign there. We can also configure our widgets easily. So before, like for example, this checklist widget, if we dropped it in, every widget has this little gear so that you can configure it. We used to have to first select the project and then click it again and then select the checklist that we wanted to load. Now we can do it with one click here. So once I drop the checklist widget in, I can tell it what project I want to load and at the same time, choose what checklist I want to see. So again, slight improvement, but I think it's a, it's a bit of a click time saver and, and I think it's kind of cool. 
Also the reports uh, widgets. So every time we do a, 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 a push to central or we build on central, central is gonna kick off a scan of your project and report on any critical issue. So you don't have to think about running it in Flare. You don't have to think about running that analysis. If your projects are cloned on Central, it's just going to do it for you automatically. So I dropped in some, some reports or some widgets, report widgets that I want to pay attention to because I'm building these projects nightly. So when I log in, I can see right away, gosh, I've got some broken links that happened overnight. Uh, and, and so I can tend to it right away. Um, the, what's nice, and I'll go ahead and so if I select it, of course, it goes right there. But for any project that I'm on, when I pull up the reports, I don't have to add those little tiles to my home dashboard and configure them one by one if I don't want to. I can go ahead and add my home dash, I can add these little widgets to either my home dashboard or my project dashboard. That's the other place where we have this dashboard on individual projects. So we can select what dashboard we want to drop it in and what reports we want to see. So it's a way to add these report tiles to the project that we're looking at with one click of a button. We don't have to add them individually and then continually reconfigure them. We can do it right from the reports page. So I think that's a nice improvement too. Um, one last thing I want to mention, the task calendar widget got a little bit of an update. So I'm looking at my task. I have two task calendars here. I'm looking at me, and I'm also looking at Mike's calendar as well, just to make sure we're not overloaded on anything. So what we did is we simplified it a little bit. And when you click on an actual day, um, you'll be able to see what the task is. So here I've got a task due on the 24th updated style sheet. And if I click on it, I can get the details. Before, I mean, it was it was great before, but I think this streamlines what we see a little bit. It's a little bit more directed and it's a little cleaner. Um, we still have access to all of that task information. All right, I'm 12 minutes over and I apologize. And I'm seeing some amazing questions coming through. And I probably forgot something. So I hope you're, you'll continue to ask the questions. Um, but let me just look real quick here and to see if I can ask some questions that multiple people asked if you want to stay on just a few minutes here. Um, Here's an interesting question. How backward compatible is it? If you start a project in Flare 2019, could it be edited in Flare 2017? So this I see kind of coming up a couple times, so I, this is why I'm asking it. Um, generally, they're, if you open up a project in the current version, generally they are compatible. You just have to be a little bit mindful because that's, you know, 2017 is a few versions behind. There are a lot of features and fixes in 2019 that didn't live in 2017. So if you have a project in 2019 and you're utilizing some new things, you know, you may run into a little bit of a conflict because you're not going to have access to that in, in Flare 2017. I always recommend using the same version if you're, you know, Pick a version and, and be on it as a team. I think you run into a lot less um, things that way. And I think it's best practice to have everybody working on the same version. Uh, OK, so let me look at some more questions here. Uh, OK, so a question came up on CSS. How is using a CSS variable different from using a style class? So that's a good question. And I sort of scratched my head the first time I read about these things too. So the CSS variable is used to define a property that may be used to many style classes. So rather than set the property within that individual style class, you can use a variable in multiple style classes. So if you need to change the property, you're not going into all the style classes where you made that individual change, you just update your variable in one place. So I hope that answered the question, but that's the difference between using a variable and just using a different style class. Uh, where is the style sheet found in the project? Well, I'll pull up Flare again. Style sheets generally by default are going to hang out in our resources folder. So that's that folder that all projects have that store a lot of the supporting files to our topic. So generally they're going to be here in their own folder called, oops, I opened up snippets, style sheets here in my project organizer. So let me see, there's a couple other questions here and I'm gonna maybe stay on one more minute. Uh, while this is open, keep typing in your questions because there's no way I'm gonna get to them all, but we'll certainly send out a question and answer document because these are some great questions and I'm so glad you all are asking them. Uh, can you use CSS variables in online help templates? 
because I would have saved a bunch of time if I could have set color variables in my online help template when I was testing and changing stuff a lot. Yes, um, CSS variables can be used to define values in online help outputs and also print-based outputs as well. Okay. Um, we're getting lots of loves and likes for CSS variables. I'm so glad because once I learned about these, I thought everybody would really enjoy them too. Um, okay. Uh, a couple questions about the at media section that I mentioned and I didn't explain. What is an at media section? That's a really good question. What that refers to are style sheet mediums. So uh, a style sheet medium is, it, I like to think of it as a way to single source our style sheets. Where, I mean, we, have, we may have a set of styles in our style sheets that define how things look when we look at something in a web browser. So our H1s may be, you know, blue and, you know, 14 point and bold for whatever reason, okay? Um, when we look at that same information in print, maybe we want to remove any kind of color when we go to print because when people print out their content they don't want it we maybe we don't want them using a lot of color ink so maybe we want to set the value of that style to be you know black in the print version of our style sheet so i'll open up my style sheet here and i feel, still think i've got my print version um, loaded well let me open up my variable here since i was playing with that so here we've got you know, we've, we've got what the default's going to show. But if we wanted to, we could select, we could set this to um, black or some sort of grayscale so that when we go to print, the value is going to be black. So when we, when we produce PDFs, for example, it's going to use the print version of our style sheet. We don't need to have two style sheets in our project necessarily. We don't have to have one to define how things are going to look online and one to define how things are going to look in print. It's a way to have a single style sheet and take on different properties depending on what we're publishing. So the most common uh, mediums are going to be um, uh, print and also um, media queries like, like mobile or tablet. So when the smaller screen sizes are detected, different style properties show up. So I hope that that was a kind of a long answer to your good short question and I hope that helped. Um, okay. I think I have time for one more question. Okay, I'm just looking at something that maybe many people have asked because it's probably something that everybody wants to know. Um, so a, a question again on micro content. So you define a snippet specifically to be used for your micro content. Again, snippets are one element in our Flare project that we can use as a response to the phrase. So we can use snippets, um, we can use entire topics, although again, it's micro content, so we may not wanna use the entire topic, unless it's kind of small. But generally, snippets are great as a response because they generally all are smaller than a full topic. Uh, so in terms of leveraging existing content, snippets can be used. We can link to, again, if we want to, entire topics or maybe a bookmark area within a topic, like a particular heading, for example. We can create our micro content natively in the micro content editor. Or if we're in a topic, we can select an area that we want to become a response and, and create micro content right from within our topic. And it'll prompt us to generate a phrase and then use that selected information as our response. So I hope that answered the question. So I'm gonna keep this open for just a moment. Um, and I, I do wanna point out a couple things here. We already took a look at central. Um, one other thing that I want to mention, I went a little bit out of order, apologies. Um, I want to just mention the, Mat the Madcap authoring and management system has been updated with this release. The pricing of it hasn't changed, but we did include Madcap Connect for Zendesk uh, with your uh, AMS subscription, so you don't have to pay extra for it. Um, it is available as a free trial if you don't have AMS, if you just have Flair, so you can, if something you're interested in, activate it when you want to test it, and it can be purchased on its own. There is a promotion for new license purchases. So if you purchase new licenses of Flare for a limited time, you get Madcap Connect for Zendesk free. You get a free 12-month subscription. So contact sales, sales at madcapsoftware.com, or your individual rep if you have that person's email address, and we'd be happy to answer any questions about the uh, Madcap Connect for Zendesk. 
and if you're an existing customer, what things can be done, um, et cetera. So please reach out to us if you have questions, but just know that it is free to try for 30 days, and that trial won't start until you actually click that activate button in the publishing destination. So not to worry if you can't test it right away and it's something that you want to do. And then the last thing I want to mention, reminder, we got Mad World coming up starting this weekend. So if any of you are going to be attending, I hope to see you there. Can't wait to see you. And then we also have Dublin coming up in October. So you can register by the, um, oops, it looks like that's a little outdated. So there is a new uh, registration deadline with a, a little early bird registration discount. So check out our website and all the updated pricing and the deadline is there. And with that, I just want to throw my email address up here. Uh, and I want to thank everybody. I'm 20 minutes over. Thanks for sticking on and taking the time with me. And I want to thank you all for your great questions. And I'm sorry that I couldn't get to them all. But I hope you enjoyed reviewing all of these new features. I hope you'll get 2019 installed as a uh, as a trial. And you know, by the way, if you're on an older version, 2019 will install side by side to your older version. So if you want to tinker and test a little bit with a, a sample project or a copy of your project, don't worry, you can. It's not going to install on top of your old one. So I hope you can get it downloaded. Try and tinker with some of these new features. We'd love to hear from you. Keep the great feature suggestions coming. Would love the feedback. Drop me a line, good, bad, or ugly. Um, and and we, we really want to hear what you guys think of these new features, uh, particularly the micro content and how you can imagine this stuff evolving, because I know that there's a lot of fun stuff coming down the pike when it comes to, to micro content. So thanks everybody for joining. Thanks again for taking the time. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week. And if we're not seeing you at Mad World, then we hope to see you on the next webinar. Take care, everybody. <laughs>